I want to talk to you this morning about um, this creation. Can you imagine? I don't know about you. Did, those of you that are of an age to remember actually seeing that on television, um, does it still bring back those feelings? Did, I don't know. Did you get, um, I won't call them duck bumps this time. <laughs> did you get goosebumps? That's an amazing, can you imagine what it would have been like to be an eyewitness to God's creation? As he just spoke, the Bible's very clear in Genesis chapter 1, he just spoke and it happened. The main story, or the main character in the story, is God. It's about him. He's the center of it, he's the, the main, he's, he's really the primary character in, in the story. And what we do is we're going to spend this journey discovering or finding our individual stories inside God's story. A lot of folks don't realize that they're part of God's story. A lot of folks, man, they just, they do a lot of things. They live for themselves. They live for other people. They, they're good folks. They, they're, they're moral and they're, they're, they're kind and they're generous, but they don't necessarily believe that they're part of God's story. And unfortunately, at the end of the story, when we get down to the end of September and into, into October and we begin to talk about Revelation, there's going to come a time when they're going to realize that they didn't exist by themselves, that they were part of a bigger story. Our job is to recognize that we're part of this big story, and it's God's story. It's not our story. It's his story, and we're a player in his story. It starts with a big bang. And I, we live in an age that when I say Big Bang, everybody from old to young immediately thinks evolution, two rocks colliding in the sky, some, well, in space somewhere, and out of that comes this little thing called Earth, and it somehow miraculously it settles into a, a solar system that is absolutely, I mean, scientifically, it's so tightly knit together that one deviation in that structure of rotating around a sun would blow everything up. But that happened by chance, they say. And then also, they take it even further, and then they're in the, the, the well, what do they call that? The primordial ooze. A cell developed by chance. And out of that cell came this thing that then grew fins and then legs and came out of the water and up on the land. And now all of creation, all, every living, breathing thing in the world came out of that one cell. Look, I, that's preposterous. It's ridiculous. The idea of evolution doesn't hold the test because if, we're, if the theory of evolution is that the survival of the fittest, those who are the fittest survive, then why are there still anything else? Why aren't we all what we are? Why, why isn't the world full of humans? Why are there still animals left? It doesn't work that way. The Big Bang that I believe in is God speaking, and bam, it happened. And that was huge, and that's exciting. And so I hope that you begin to see um, that it wasn't some impersonal accident that occurred randomly, but that God ordained it, and God spoke it, and God placed it. And if you start to grasp the idea that he did that, I got to tell you, that helps you when life's spinning out of control. Because if, he's, if he placed it, he's holding it together. And if he's holding it together, he cares. And if he cares then you and I have hope. And we'll get there in the long run. We'll get to that as we move along. Each week, I think you'll, you have the opportunity to come face to face with your Savior. You'll come face to face with God, leaving the upper story and entering the lower story, even though he didn't have to. Why? Because he loves us. So creation starts this way. There's three days. You heard a couple of those days with the astronauts. I found it very, very interesting that they stopped where they stopped. Because they didn't go on to talk about God speaking the plant life into, into being. They didn't go on to talk about God speaking the animals into being. They didn't go on to talk about God being fashioned into the, uh, fashioning out of the mud of the earth man. They kind of just stopped right there. And I thought that was interesting that that's where they chose to stop. Maybe they shut them off. I don't, can you imagine the uproar today? If, if the fellows who went out, on the, went out to fix the Hubble telescope got up there and saw, you know, the Hubble telescope, by the way, the, the last thing that I've seen reported, and they probably have something new, but as far out as it could see, it found a cluster. And inside this cluster 
uh, of uh, this grouping of planets and stars. Well, I don't know if it was a galaxy. I don't remember all the details. But in the very center of this cluster is a shadow of a cross. God trying to get our attention even there. But can you imagine if when they saw that and they saw the cross, they immediately began to talk about Jesus? How God left the upper story and came down into the lower story to take on flesh. Why? To redeem us and save us, to die for us, to become sin. Can you imagine what would happen? Oh, the, oh, the internet would blow up. They would probably be fired from the astronaut program. People would be screaming about separation of church and state. People would, people would be trying to... Because when you are apart from Christ, when you're apart from God, when you don't have a relationship with Christ, you may not be able to pinpoint it, but there's something angry inside you. You can mask it and you can hide Because, friends, you and I were created by God to be in relationship with God. That's the whole reason that he created the upper story for us. It's the whole reason that he, he, he reached down into the lower story for us. We're created to be in relationship with him. And when you don't get that, there's something broken inside you. And you may look successful and you may think you're successful and you may move through this life being, being touted as the guy or the gal that everybody wants to be. But inside, inside, none of it heals you. Only Jesus. And that's, that's God reaching into the lower story. We'll talk about that um, as we go along each week as well. So you have the light and the dark. You have the sky and the water. You have the land. Uh, I, again, just picture that. Picture a, 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 a blank screen, and then all of a sudden you begin to see, and you see the light and the dark, and you see the, sun, the, the, the sky and the water, and you see the water separating and the land rising up. That would just be very, very exciting. And it goes on with days four, five, and six. They're filled with the things that, were, that the places were created for. God created the waters. He created the land. He put the sun and the moon into rotation. He put the earth into rotation. He did all of this. He put it all together. And then he began to create the things that he created that for. The sun and the moon and the stars. The sea and the bird, birds and the sea creatures. All of the animals that were there. Humans. You and I. Created by God. He, he painted this beautiful picture. And then he stuck us in it. And he looked at us. He said, oh, it's very good. Not that we're the best of his creation, but because that's what he created it for. We're the ones that he created it for. He gave us a place to live. He gave, I don't know about you, but it's really hard this time of year to see the beauty that God has given us, isn't it? I drove in this morning thinking, oh, man. I was just in Baltimore, and there's hardly any snow and you can see when you're driving down the highway and you look out into the woods, you can see out into the woods and you can see all, all I saw driving in was ice on the road, nasty gray, dirty snow, ice ruts everywhere. This is the time of year when, when I, I don't like this time of year. When we were stationed up in Hancock, Michigan, it was really bad because they didn't use salt on the roads. They wouldn't have ever had enough salt. They used uh, this, this black mining stamp sand, they called it. And they would sand the road, and the roads were beautiful uh, because the roads got smooth, and it almost became like pavement. Would be, they were wider. There weren't any potholes. But, man, by the, by the, well, not this time. This is only January. It would have been about April up there when it began to melt and thaw, and all you saw was the dirty, dirty snow, and it was gray, and it just was, it's really hard to get excited. So I want, you, I want you, when you begin this process of moving through this week, thinking about today, thinking about creation, take your mind somewhere where you like to be. Take, take yourself to the beach. Take yourself to the sunset. Um, I was reminded of the sunset on the flight back because we came up through some real, it was a, a bit of a bumpy ride up, and it was so thick that at one point I couldn't even see the, I was sitting on the wing, and I couldn't even see the end of the wing because the, the, the cloud bank was so thick. But all of a sudden we broke above it, and man, it was beautiful. You could see the, the, the red horizon, and we flew in between two big cloud banks, which was pretty cool too. But it reminded me, hey, don't worry about what's, don't worry about what's ugly around you. Begin to think about God's creation. Begin to see it for what it is. Because even that has purpose. Even that snow melting in the rain has purpose. 
And so we want to make sure that we're, 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 we're loving God's creation. But for those of you that find that this is just a depressing place to look at, you know, this time of year, go somewhere else. Go to the beach in your mind. Go to, go, to, go to a sunset. Go to Alaska. I don't care. Just go somewhere so you can really begin to grasp that God created this just for you. Think of a flower. You can go on the Internet and go anywhere anymore. You can go into outer space and take a look out there and see what he's created just for us, that we can be a part of it. Um, his core passion is us, you and I. He created us in his image. He didn't do that with anything else. All the way through to animals, he didn't, it, it just didn't happen. He looked at it and he saw that it was good. And then he said, let us create man and let us create man in our, uh, in our image. The us and the we and the our image, that points to the Trinity of God. The God, the Father, God, the Son, and God, the Holy Spirit. And we're created in their image. And then he did something he didn't do with anything else. He breathed life into us. And what he breathed into us is what's going to live forever. This stuff's going to go away. This stuff is going to go back, ashes to ashes, dust to dust. It's going to return to the earth. But our soul, that essence that God breathed into us, is going to live on. And that's what he cares about. And that's why when bad things happened, when wrong choices were made, and we'll talk about those in a minute, when, when that separation happened and the lower story be, became created and we were put into that lower story because of Adam and Eve's choice, what happened there, because he cares about us, because he cares about what he created, because he created us in his image to be in relationship with him, he set about a plan of redemption for every one of us, not just for a select few, but for every single one of us. All the beauties of creation are secondary to you and I. Are you hearing me? God's not in the trees. He created them. He still makes them grow and process through and do all the stuff that they do. He didn't cre he's not in the rocks. But he's in us. If we let him. We're created in his image. Everything else is secondary. His, his, um, his passion. I, I, sometimes I, I feel sort of awkward trying to attribute to God, um, I was going to say his drive, his passion. You know, he, he, he's huge. He's eternal. He doesn't need us. He's self-sufficient all by himself. He doesn't need us, but he wants us. And his passion, his drive is to be in relationship with us. So he created. And now we have the Big Bang coming up. The fall. We talked about those. Adam and Eve's rebellion. So I want you to, I want you to take a minute and I want you to think about this. Um, here we have this, this beautiful place. And we have Adam and Eve created in the image of God, created with freedom, created to be able to do the things that... that, that God wants it. He, he created them. He breathed life into them. And then, and then, he walked with them. Ah, yeah, a, yeah, that's pretty exciting stuff, isn't it? I don't know. Y'all don't seem very excited. But can you imagine? He created and the creator of the universe. And he, and he walked in the cool of the day with Adam and Eve. And he talked with them. And can you imagine what he would be saying to them? Talking about, see that flower over there, Eve? That was just for you. Let's go sit by the river. Can you imagine sitting on the bank of the river and listening to it with God just talking to you about how much he loves you? I did this all for you. I did this for you. And yet it wasn't enough for them, was it? It's oftentimes not enough for us either. He gave them the power and the freedom to make choices. Just like you with, Bob, you're a great grandpa, aren't you? I mean, not a great grandpa, but you're, a, you're an excellent grandpa, right? I don't want to age you too fast. Um, but it wouldn't, be, it wouldn't be the same if Miles was made to love you, would it? When he crawls up on your lap and he grabs a hold of your phone and he lays his head back on your shoulder, that's a great picture, by the way. I don't know if it was a phone or iPad. Maybe it was the iPad. Great picture. There's, there is, um, that's, a, that's a powerful feeling. But if you tried to make someone love you, force them to love you, that feeling's not the same. God didn't do that. He gave them the choice. He said, here's the choice. 
And the choice settled around these things. Everything that you have, everything that you see, I give to you. You can care for it. You tend it. You can, you can eat of any of these fruits from the trees or the bushes. It's all yours. I did this because I love you. This is my gift to you. There's just one thing. There's two trees that you can't eat from. And I don't know if this was a test. I'm not sure. I've read a few different things about it. But ultimately, it comes down to this. There's a tree of life and a tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And those trees you can't eat from. Everything else is yours. You care for it. You tend it. When I was a kid, um, we had a family down the street. Their name was uh, Bogner. And they had a little orchard. They had a great, some grapevines, and they had um, some fruit trees, a, pear, a couple pear, pear trees and apple trees. But there's a big fence around all that. <laughs> That's just like saying to a kid, come on in. Um, and we used, to, we used to climb up in there all the time and, and sit up in the tree, pick a piece of fruit out of the tree, and eat it, sitting in the tree. How many of you have ever done something like that? Sat at the bay. You remember how it felt? Can you imagine Adam and Eve with God and his blessing? Now, we were always had one eye looking out for Mr. Bogner because he was not very nice. He had, a, he, had a, he had a small little shotgun that he filled with rock salt. <laughs> and he liked to chase you off, the, off, the, off there. And if you didn't get over the fence fast enough, you found out about it. Um, he never hurt anybody, but still, it was kind of scary. Probably be in jail today. Um, sitting with God right here, and taking from his, his creation, and taking a bite of an apple, take a pear that's so juicy and so, so good that it just runs down your face and it fills your heart with joy. And yet, they got twisted up. They began to look at what they couldn't have as opposed to what they had. And that was Satan's great deception in there. And you know what? He hasn't changed his method since then. Because what he does is he, he, he won't necessarily come at you really hard with a, with a big, strong temptation right off the bat. But what he'll do is he'll scratch the ground a little before he drops the seed. And the scratching of the ground with Adam and Eve was real simple. He said, did God really say you couldn't eat of these trees? This, what, I'm in this tree right here. He said you couldn't eat this tree? And he successfully took their eyes off of all that they had and focused it on the thing that they couldn't have. And isn't that our problem? Doesn't that kind of cut right down to the root of it for us? Well, he said we could... Yeah, I think he did say if we ate off that tree, we would die. Oh, no, no. Surely, surely you won't die. Pam, you won't die. You, you Eve, you won't die. He just doesn't want you to know what he knows. That's all. And in that moment... <laughs> In that moment, the motivation for every sin committed from that point forward reared its ugly head and it was all about ego and it was all about self. I do want to know. I'm dissatisfied with all of this. I'm dissatisfied with all of it because I want what I want. And by the way, I want it right now. And I don't want to wait. And that's a problem that has plagued us all the way through. They, they made a choice. They rebelled against God. They ate from the forbidden tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And God's vision to be with people was ruined because God is holy and God is righteous and God is just and God is good. And he cannot, the Bible, when you read the Bible, you discover over and over and over again how much God hates sin. He cannot be in the presence of it. The whole sacrificial system through the Old Testament was based on the blood covering us so that God could be in relationship with us. What's going to happen? That beautiful story, that beautiful upper story just got broken by Adam and Eve and they made a choice. And his vision for his, his walking of the, in the cool of the day of sitting next to us under the apple tree as we eat an apple, sitting over here, walking with us as we fellowship with each other and with him. All of his, all of his vision for mankind that was breathed into Adam and Eve 
was broken by their choice. And it was ruined. And the Bible goes on and tells us then about the damage that happens. It, it's a big bang too. Because we know, well maybe, maybe you're new to the Bible and you don't know. But what happens is that Adam and Eve get cast out of the garden. And God says to Eve, you're going to have pain in childbirth. And God says to Adam, you're going to work really hard on the land and it's, you're going to produce thorns and brambles and you're going, to, you're going to suffer. It's going to be difficult. This beautiful place, this, this upper story is no longer for you because you chose. However, I'll make a plan and I got a plan because I love you that I'm going to enter the lower story. And he makes that prophecy through the serpent. He says, he casts the serpent out, and he said there's going to be enmity between the serpent and Eve. Representing uh, Jesus and his death on the cross. Because Adam and Eve chose a different vision that they thought, but how, can I stop right here for a second and ask you a question, and you don't have to answer it out loud, but, but just think about it yourself. How many times have you chosen your own vision because you thought it was better than God's vision? How many times have you chosen to do what you wanted to do, even though perhaps you knew in the back of your mind it was not what God would want you to do? Yeah? A couple heads are nodding. You're in the same place that they were. You've done the same thing. And the reason why is because their choice wired into our DNA the sinful nature. Now, there are some who will say that's not true. People, man, kind is inherently good. And I would simply say, watch the news and tell me that again. Because it's not. We aren't. And if you want proof of that, let's, let's go along. We go from Cain and Abel. Cain, born, Abel born of Adam and Eve. And what happens? Their sin, wired into Cain and Abel's DNA, sin. A sin nature. Cain got ticked off. He, he, he Abel gave a beautiful offering and Cain gave a, an offering and it maybe was his heart wasn't in it. Maybe it was not the best that he could offer and God was more pleased with Adam's offering. Sometimes David and Betsy, um, when they were growing up, one of them would do something for me and I would praise them and the other one would look at me like I completely neglected them. Like that's not fair. They, you know what, I'll, he's here, he's right there. Betsy's not here, but I will say that sometimes they still do that. So when one of them will say, well, who do you love more? I'll say, or they'll be arguing and I'll say, well, you know, David, I love, it's the reason I treat Betsy nicer is because I love her more than you. <laughs> Just kidding, of course. I love them differently, but fully, both. Um, Cain and Abel, the, the sacrifice wasn't there. Cain got mad. He, he said, that's not fair to me. And he killed Abel. Cain gets cast out. The generations begin, people begin to populate the earth. The generations begin to happen. And all of a sudden, here we have Noah. God is so grieved, so absolutely grieved by the state of mankind's choosing that he's had enough. But then he sees Noah. He says, all right, Noah, because you're righteous... Because you're a good man, because you love me, because you care about me, because you're righteous, I'm going to save you and your family, but I'm destroying everybody else. And I'm sending a flood, so build a boat. In the desert, really big. Kind of crazy, didn't make a lot of sense, but Noah believed God. And Noah believed that what God said was more important than what he wanted. And so he did it. And I'm sure that they made fun of him. I'm sure he was ridiculed. I'm sure that it just was not a, uh, uh, he wasn't considered a very cool guy. He wasn't one of the hipsters. He was on the outside for that. And yet he did it. Brought in animals, two of a kind. Male and female, he brought them. Floods came. The earth and everybody on it. All the people destroyed. All the animals destroyed. Innocent animals suffering because of man's choice. The planet suffering because of man's choice. After a period of time, the waters recede. They move out. They, they land on ground. The animals move out. Everything begins to flow. And everything should be good, right? Because Noah was righteous. 
And if man is inherently good and we don't have a, a, a spiritual DNA wired for or a, 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 DNA, a, a sin nature wired into our DNA, then it should be okay. But Noah gets drunk and his sons take a look at his nakedness. Now, I'm not sure what all that means. All I know is that it was considered sin at the time and they sinned. So tell me, tell me, if Noah was righteous and we aren't wired for sin because of Adam and Eve's choice, why'd they do it? Because, folks, we have a sin nature now. We tend to want to do that easier than we want to do the righteous thing. We tend to want to choose those things more than we want to choose the things of God. And it's a constant battle that goes on inside of us. Paul, the Apostle Paul, who's a, a hero of the faith, should be one of those folks that we can't, meet to, can't wait to meet when we get to heaven, just to, just to say thank you to him for living the life that he lived. Even he said, why is it that I continue to do the things I know I ought not to do? I know I shouldn't do them. I continue to do them. And the things I know that I should be doing, the righteous things, I don't do them. This wretched body of sin. But praise be to God, in Christ Jesus. There's a way out. There's a way out. Say it again really loud. Yeah, there's a way out. Uh, let's see where we're at. We talked about that. We talked about that. Here we go. We have a salvation clue even in the midst of the opening Big Bang. Let's go back for a second. We've talked about Noah. Now we realize sitting in this room right now, there should not be anybody at all that has this false idea that somehow you're good and the rest of us have sin nature, but you don't. We all have sin nature. Everybody in here should be able to say, okay, I get that. Major, I got that. I'll own that. Let's go back to Adam and Eve. Let's go back to that moment when they made a choice that corrupted all of us that made our choosing good more difficult and our choosing bad easier. Satan lays the trap. Surely he didn't say, oh, but he did. Oh, he just doesn't want you to. You don't, he doesn't want you to be like him. They eat. And the scripture says immediately their eyes were opened and they realized that they were naked. So they grabbed some fig leaves off the tree and some vines and they stitched them together and they covered up their nakedness. And I'm not sure why that was so, such a problem. I don't know. I, I, all I know is that in the Bible it says it's important because they, they all of a sudden had shame in their life. All of a sudden they realized they made a wrong choice and that, that what we call a guilty conscience, that shame was there. And when they looked at each other, they knew they chose wrong. They, know, they knew they chose to violate the command of God and they were ashamed. And so they covered themselves with fig leaves. And here comes God. He's, it's this time. He's, he's been off doing his thing, whatever he was doing. He's going to come walk with them. Maybe he was creating another universe out there that had a cross in the center of it just for us. Where are you? Adam, where are you? God's omniscient. That means he's all-knowing. He knew where they were. Don't you, parents, you ever do that to your kids? You ask them a question, you already know the answer. You're just waiting to see if they'll tell you the truth. If they'll own their stuff, that'll tell you if you've been raising them right. <laughs> Where are you? What have you done? What have you done? Okay, let's, what have you done? What have you done? Four words. Those are deep words, man. The upper story, all of creation, created and given to Adam and Eve. What have you done? My plan to be with you, my desire to be in fellowship with you, in relationship with you, all of this, what have you done? <laughs> Adam, classic. Well, that woman that you gave me, <laughs> yeah, isn't that it? Let's, let, isn't that, that's our response as human. Our sin nature says it's someone else's fault. And if we can't find anybody here to blame right here that we can look at, then we're going to blame God because he, he, he made life hard. He didn't take care of us the way we thought he should. He didn't give us the things we thought we deserved. And so it's his fault. And we walk away from that upper story. That woman that you gave me. 
And that's when God pronounces judgment. And he kills an animal. Kills one of his creation that he spoke into being. He spoke blood and life into the animal. Not life like you and I, not in his image, not in his essence, but the process of, of breathing and blood moving. He did that. And he took that animal and he killed that animal and he covered them with fur. And there's blood shed for the first time. And that's a clue, folks, that the only way that we can be in relationship with God is by shed blood. The Old Testament runs a whole track of animal sacrifice as a covering. That the blood put on the goat and the goat sent out into the desert as a scapegoat, taking our sin away until Jesus. And God spoke about this. And he continued to speak about it all the way through the Bible. And he talked about Jesus. And he talked about the fact that he was going to leave the upper story and enter the lower story. And in entering the lower story, he was going to take on our sin. I don't know if you grasp this concept. And I don't know how I can, how I can explain it. Imagine that you have a white board and it's, it's just, it, it hasn't been touched by anything. It's, it's as white and shiny as can be. That's God's righteousness. That's Jesus. And then on those moments on the cross, when he died, it's as if all of the mud and yuck and slime of this earth, all of the sin, all of our sin was thrown on him, and he became that. It didn't just cover him. He became, the Bible says he became our sin. He who knew no sin, who's part of the upper story, creating for us, loving us so much that he was willing to become that which was ugly. And the proof of that is when he says on the cross, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? In that moment, God turned away and, and Christ died our death for us. And he did it that we might have life. And that's the great story of, of, of the resurrection. Because down went our sin and up came new life. So you and I, we, can, we, we live in this lower story, folks. It's part of who we are. We have this sin nature inside of us that crouches at the door like a hungry lion waiting to tear into our flesh every choice that we make, little or big. And don't fool yourself into thinking that the little choices don't matter. Because they do. You cannot wink and nod at those things that are sin in God's eyes because if you do, you're driving a wall, between, building a wall between you and God. You're separating yourself. You're descending deeper into the lower story and you're, you're, you're taking value away from the sacrifice that Christ has made for you. Those of you who call yourselves believers, the obligation on us is to live as, as close to sinful, as sinless, <laughs> Woo! Almost, that would have been scary, wouldn't it? I wouldn't want to have been up here. To live as close to a sinless life as we can in our hearts, to desire not to sin. I know that we're, we, we, I know that we're in the flesh, and I know that this flesh has fallen, and I understand that we're in this battle, and I know that we have this carnal nature, that, this sin nature that battles against this righteous nature inside of it. I get it, but he who is in me is greater than he that is in the world, and he who is in me, Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit, is greater than me. And so I have confidence and I have power and I have strength and I have the ability to make a choice every single moment of every single day to honor God with that choice and to live for him. And there's no excuse when I don't. It's not Bev's fault. It's not David's fault. It's not Bob's fault. It's not anybody's fault. It's not traffic's fault. It's, not, it's, it's nobody's fault. I choose daily whether I believe in the upper story, whether I believe in God's coming into the lower story to save us. And so the choice is ours. I'm going to ask the praise team to come, and I'm going to ask you to stand on your feet. We're at that point now. We can live in the slime. We can live in the bottom of that story, or we can live with the hope of that upper story. And it's up to us. Now, I don't know about you, but um, I'm going to come down here and pray because I was stuck in an airport and I was stuck with people and I was stuck with what I thought were the stupidest decisions an airline could ever make. And I have to tell you, I was unkind 
in my mind. And as I'm standing up here thinking about that, I'm thinking, you know, it sounds funny, and you can say it, and it sounds trite, but you know what? No, it, the devil was tempting me. He was scratching the surface to plant a seed, and I'm not going to let him. So I'm taking that choice that I made that was contrary to, to the character of God, and I'm going to bring it to this altar this morning. And I'm going to leave it there because the altar represents Jesus Christ's sacrifice for us, the cleansing of his blood, the restored relationship and the redemption that comes. And I'm going to ask you to look at your life and look at your choices. Yesterday, the day before, the day before that. And you know what? If you're real honest and you let God show you, I'll meet you down here, okay? Okay.